Recently, the internet has been awash with people talking about a certain Netflix show which has really captured the public's imagination. There have been hot takes, think pieces on the characters' motivations, and even posts trying to figure out exactly what everything was supposed to mean. Except, I'm not talking about Bojack Horseman, no. I'm talking about Netflix's recent reality show slash free week event, Love is Blind. After binging the series, I was left with one simple question. What the hell did I just watch? Seriously, Love is Blind is a truly bizarre format, a sort of composite of every popular dating show of the past 10 years mashed together to make something vaguely original. It takes the sincerity of first dates, the pseudo-relationship science of Married at First Sight, and the isolation and tension of Love Island, and sticks them all in a blender, in the hope that the resulting show will somehow cohere into a satisfying whole. And for the most part, it works. Partially because the show's back premise makes it instantly compelling, but also because Love is Blind is such a hodgepodge of different formats that it may just be the craziest dating show of all time. Love is Blind's basic setup is quite similar to Married at First Sight, in that it builds itself as a relationship experiment in which strangers impulsively get engaged after only knowing each other for a brief period of time. But it actually shares more in common with Naked Attraction, albeit in a reverse fashion. Rather than strangers deciding to date each other based on purely physical elements, the contestants on Love is Blind have to impulsively marry each other based solely on their personalities. This is achieved through the boys and girls being segregated from one another, and only being able to talk to the opposite sex through the walls of the pods, which have an aesthetic which is sort of a cross between the sets of Logan's Run and the Diary Room from Big Brother. Before the 10 day time limit is up, the contestants have to propose to one another, and if their partner of choice accepts, they leave the pods as future husband and wife, and are able to meet each other in person for the first time. Whilst 10 days doesn't seem a long time to determine whether you want to marry someone, most of these singletons get engaged way before the allotted time is up, like these two, who decide that they're each of the soulmates after just five days? Will you marry me? <laughs> oh my god, yes. Yes, Cameron. What I love about this show's casting is that Netflix has clearly taken the time to select people who totally buy into this show's insane premise. Most of these people spend their time touting the same platitudes about how they didn't expect this to happen or how they've always felt incomplete until now. It's more about what's on the inside. If that heart is beautiful, if your soul speaks to my soul. People here are falling in love through a wall. It's crazy kind of magic, but it works. No matter how good looking we are, what type of body we have, we all want to be loved, we all want to be accepted. Whilst this seems like it might be a bit insipid, and to some extent, it is, there's an earnestness and unpretentiousness to the whole thing which allows it to work. The contestants on this show genuinely believe that this experience will find them the love of their life, and it's this level of sincerity which makes so many of them easy to root for. Like Mark, a guy who spends the majority of the show talking about how he's all in with Jessica, a woman who doesn't really seem to feel the same way about him. Like, I, I love you, like, it's crazy. All the other related dates I've had, I didn't feel like, that pat like that. But more on them in a bit. This willingness to go along with the show's wild premise doesn't just make for the sweet moments, however, but also motivates a lot of the show's drama. One of the earliest conflicts on the show involves Barnett, a guy who is trying to choose between three different girls. The issue here is less that Barnett is worrying about committing to one person in such a hasty fashion, but rather that Barnett is so committed to the whole process that he seems to fall in love almost immediately, as if every single conversation that this guy has with a woman ends in him thinking that he's met the one. It's like, it's like whoever I saw last is my number one. So. <laughs> Barnett's internal drama also reveals another insight into what makes this show work. The fact that whilst the guys and girls aren't able to see one another, they are able to interact uninhibited with the people of their respective gender. Which means that whilst Barnett stresses over who to choose, the girls he's been stringing along can all chat to each other. And the level of delusion is high. There's gonna be a wedding and they will be there. I'm sorry, it's, it's gonna happen. So, it sucks to be them. I know what Barnett and I have is special and totally different from what he has with her. The decision to let the boys and girls talk to each other in between dates also pushes forward the show's best love triangle, the one between Barnett, Jessica, and Mark. Whilst Jessica and Mark make a supposedly instant connection, Jessica is then tempted away by Barnett after he tells her he plans on proposing to her. Because of this, she swiftly decides to break it off with Mark, who by this point has decided that he is madly in love with her. If I'm not walking out of here with you, then I'll go my separate way and I'll go home. The only problem with Jessica's plan? Well, Barnett is so liable to changing his mind that he immediately decides that he'd rather pursue Amber, which leads to an extremely tense showdown. I don't fuck with people like you. What does that mean? Like, I'm not playing this game with you. This means that Jessica really only has one option to come crawling back to Mark. So sorry, I feel like such an asshole. I just like, I don't know, I felt like I had to like. And despite what Mark said earlier. 
Like, I'm not just a fucking option. He immediately takes her back. Jessica's finally telling me what she, what I've always wanted, and I don't know how to how to take it. It's like I. I just can't wrap my head around it. What makes this whole storyline so great is the level of awareness the contestants have of each other. If they'd all been kept in total isolation, Mark would never have known who Jessica's mystery man is. But instead, he has to share a living space with the guy, and it makes all of his heart-to-hearts with the other contestants painful. The same goes for Jessica, who is fully aware of who Barnett is leaving him for, and decides to try and sabotage his prospects in an excruciating scene. Again, I still strongly believe that everyone's relationship is different. Maybe he's like having issues, but he told me tonight that he just doesn't know what he wants and he's fucked up in his head. The pod sequences are the best parts of the show, and it's something of a shame when the contestants all couple up and are jetted off to Mexico for a romantic holiday together. But part of the fun of Love is Blind is that it's not really about love being blind. Instead, it's about how an idea such as love being blind is inherently idealistic. This is because, when the couples leave the pod and finally meet each other, superficial factors come into play, and the contestants become very aware that hastily rushing into an engagement may not be the best idea. In essence, the format collapses. But it also feels like this was intentional, and in many ways, Love is Blind is really sort of a demented prank show, which apes the format of popular shows such as Love Island and The Bachelor, and exposes their flaws. Whilst the initial pitch of Love is Blind may be an experiment to see whether love can thrive based on an emotional connection alone, by the end of the series, you're left convinced that committing to a complete stranger after a series of intense anonymous chats is definitely a bad idea. Although, to be fair, you probably should have already known that. As the contestants leave the pods and begin to engage with the real world again, it becomes clear that there is more to their relationships than simply declaring their love for one another. Real world factors come into play, and it becomes clear that a brief emotional connection is not a sufficient enough basis for a real relationship. This is epitomised by an argument between Damien and Gigi that takes place approximately midway through the series. What do you need to escape from? Work and drama. What do you mean drama? Yeah, it's when they life, you know. You always get a little mix of social drama and everything. Always. I mean, I don't know anything about you outside of here. I feel like you're being really vague. Oh my god. <sighs> if he doesn't want to talk about it, then I'm done. Whilst Gigi's escalation of the argument may be close to pantomime, she does raise a valid concern that has been hiding in plain sight for every single one of these relationships, that the couples barely know each other. Whilst Damien's offhand remark about getting away from it all may seem just innocuous at first, it also highlights that, up until this point, their relationships have taken place largely inside a bubble in which their attraction for each other has grown without any form of external test. As it turns out, Damien's main concern is about potentially losing his job as a result of appearing on the show, and whilst Gigi does her best to console him... The expectations that you set for yourself, you've, you've met them, at least with me. Like, you're the most caring, like I said, like... It's clear that she doesn't really know what she's talking about. She doesn't know Damien enough to know how his boss will react. She doesn't know anything about what Damien's friends or family will think. Everything up until this point has been a fantasy, and there's no way for her to know whether they're truly compatible until they return to reality. What Love is Blind does so brilliantly, and what makes it so endearing and addictive, is force the couples to face and challenge the show's ludicrous premise head on. One of the most surface level issues which the show confronts is the idea of physical attraction as an important component of relationships, which we see play out in Jessica's engagement with Mark. Whilst Mark seems to be willing to endlessly do anything for Jessica, it's clear from the get-go that Jessica has the ick, as she repeatedly tells us how she's unsure about the relationship. I adore him. We are bonded for life. But it's hard to not compare my feelings for Mark and where we're at with everyone else. I don't want us to be super disappointed when the real world smacks us in the face. What compounds this further is that the show, in a stroke of genius, decides to reunite all of the couples after they leave the pod in a brilliant sequence which acts as a sort of look at what you could have won for those who were feeling unsure about who to pair off with. Gentlemen, we want you to meet the ladies. And ladies, we want you to meet the gentlemen that you did not proposed to. This has the knock-on effect of amplifying Jessica's behaviour further, as she not only spends a large portion of her time airing her grievances to the other girls. I think I have been like struggling a little bit with the physical mm -hmm. aspect. But she also becomes reacquainted with Barnett, who she still very clearly has feelings for. My natural instinct, if it were pre-pod Jess, would be to go to Barnett. This culminates in an amazing sequence in which she basically tells Mark that she doesn't really find him attractive, finds Barnett more attractive than him, and isn't really that invested in their relationship. I think Barnett is fucking sexy and like hot and like... What the fuck is I'm that? Insane. You're insulting like, me like that. Don't insult me like that. The show isn't purely interested in debunking its own premise in terms of superficiality, however, as Love is Blind also confronts very real problems that relationships are susceptible to face, and thus highlights the inherent fantasy at the heart of its premise. 
One of the biggest recurring themes on the show is finance and lifestyle, which, as the couples begin to integrate themselves more into the lower halves' lives, creates tensions between them. For example, Barnett and Amber may have undeniable chemistry, but Barnett looks more than concerned when he finds out that not only is Amber riddled with a large amount of debt, she doesn't really have a home. I haven't paid anything. I've been out of work or I was homeless for a while. Similarly, whilst it's become something of a meme to spot how many times Jessica brings up her age gap with Mark, her point is kind of validated when we see how differently the two live. Mark is 24, still living in a house share with his friends, whereas Jessica is earning over $100,000 and lives in a large house by herself. The two are at very different stages in their lives, and the show is quick to push that whilst they may have developed an emotional connection, the two aren't really compatible in regards to their differing lifestyles. He's really strong-willed about the fact that we can get through anything, and I want to believe in that, but I'm also realistic. Likewise, Damien and Gigi struggle to develop their relationship beyond a superficial fairy tale romance, in part because they refuse to address their joint realization that they are both very different people, especially when it comes to politics. Politics can be an issue in family, friends. You think politics will be an issue? You don't think they'll ever change in any aspect at all? No, those will never change. Weirdly, the show never explicitly states what Damien's politics are, but I think it's safe to say that they fly in the face of Gigi's beliefs, and that this is something that will obviously cause long-term problems in their relationship. As I said before, however, what keeps this show so compelling is that, in spite of these obvious red flags, the contestants are so determined to make these relationships work that you can't help sort of rooting for them. There's Amber, a girl who, despite knowing that Barnett was a second away from choosing someone else over her, and only having really known him for a few weeks, reveals that if the wedding were to be called off, she'd be devastated. The possibility that he he might say no, I don't think I could survive it. There's also something weirdly endearing about Gigi's constant claims that she's losing her butterflies for Damien. Do I give you butterflies, Damien? Not right now. I lost my butterflies. Like, if her honeymoon period has literally lasted two weeks, maybe that's a sign that this whole marriage thing with a total stranger isn't really going to work. The only relationship I really buy by the end is Lauren and Cameron's, because they actually bother to work through their differences, and don't just blindly throw themselves into the format. What really takes the cake for me is the fact that, despite the fact that only two of the couples make it over the line, all of the contestants still stick to their belief that the show's premise has allowed them to discover the meaning of true love. Even though Jessica and I did not get married, I strongly believe love is mine because I made that commitment to propose through just an emotional connection. It's self-aggrandizing, ridiculous, and ultimately wrong, but you really can't help rooting for their naivety. Oh, and bonus points to the priests for totally nailing that brand synergy. Now is the time to decide if love is blind. And really? This naivety is what makes Love is Blind so entertaining. Its cast's commitment to its flimsy premise makes their journeys inevitably endearing, because as you watch them, you sort of buy into the bullshit as well. You sit there shouting at the screen, begging for them to notice how ridiculous they're being, before you realise that this show was actually shot at the tail end of 2018, and whatever stupid decisions these contestants are about to make, they've already done. And that's ultimately the hallmark of a truly great reality TV show. Thank you for watching another full fat video. Don't forget to click that subscribe button if you'd like to see more of our deep dives into reality TV. Also, huge thanks to all of our patrons, especially Dr. Chike, Jax Merrick, and Mike Nandu. You're all amazing. Until next time, stay.